Good morning, everyone. I'm very pleased today to have Ms. Maryam Shahid with me from Pakistan, from Islamabad, Pakistan. Welcome, Maryam. Thank you, sir. Uh, let me introduce Mariam to you all. I'm super excited uh, for today's interview. The reason being, uh, Ms. Shahid approached me a few weeks ago to interview me on emotions and the role emotions play in mediation. And the interview went so well, I thought, let me reverse the courtesy here and actually ask her, as a student in Master's in Peace and Conflict Resolution from National University of Sciences and Technology, Islamabad, I am very intrigued by how Mariam came to this path of understanding emotions deeply in mediation. As an international mediator, as cross-cultural mediator, I have seen the deep and impactful and important role that emotions play in our day-to-day -day mediations. So I was very uh, pleased to notice that our students, our conflict resolution students from Pakistan are also interested in not only interested in understanding mediation, conflict resolution, but also the role played by emotions. And so I am here today, I'm bringing you Mariam Shahid. She has a bachelor's in applied psychology. So it's not that she is just a conflict resolution student. She's like to, she likes to do interdisciplinary approach when it comes to knowledge gaining. And when I asked her, what would you like to do in future? She said, I want to invest in Pakistan in the future of conflict resolution and in higher education. I'm very pleased to have you. Mariam, how are you doing today? Thank you very much, sir. Um, you have really humbled me with such kind words. I am doing amazing, alhamdulillah. Well, I was very pleased to meet you and how smart you are. And I thought it will be very um, important for me to interview you, to understand your a young woman's perspective from Pakistan and your research on emotions. First question, tell us, how did you come to choose a, a thesis topic on emotions in mediation? Right. So um, as you introduced me, I have done bachelor's in applied psychology and then I uh, developed interest in international relations. So I went for my master's in peace and conflict studies. Uh, here, I think uh, one of the motivation was to go for an interdisciplinary approach uh, just to stay relevant uh, in both these fields. And most importantly, I think when it comes to mediation, this is one of those conflict resolution uh, mechanisms or strategies in which emotions play a huge part. And uh, my research in bachelor's was also revolving somewhere around emotions. So emotions, I think uh, they're very close to my heart when it comes to doing research on emotions. And uh, that's how I, I landed up here, choosing this topic. Excellent. Um, I want to explore that a little more. You are now, you see or you understand and you wish to understand further the role played by emotions in mediation. Yeah. Is that that you also observe around you the role plays that emotions play on a day-to-day -day basis? Of course. I think emotions are wherever there is human being, there is emotions. And as we say that we have a physical being, a spiritual being, and if I may say, we do have an emotional being as well. So it is very important because I think we as human beings, we have this ability that we uh, tend to receive various stimulus from our environment. And then we have this unique ability to process that, make perceptions out of that, make our own story out of that. And then that has an impact on us. And in response, uh, the human body is designed in such a way that we have uh, not only physiological responses to it, to it, we have behavioral responses to it as well. So I think it is it is very important to see how emotions function uh, what is the impact of our emotions on others? What is the impact of the emotions of others on us? And uh, it is not only during mediation that emotions are important uh, or they are pertinent. I think emotions play a very important role when it comes to decision making. Just saying, if I am happy, I will have inclinations to certain decisions that I might not have if I'm sad. So it does impact our. Uh, problem-solving skills, our uh, uh, decision-making skills, 
and at the same time i think it is very important when it comes to social interactions because human beings and social as social animals we uh, have to interact with others and a very important part of interacting with others is understanding how they feel or understanding how they experience emotions and at the same time it is equally important that we understand our own emotions as well and how our own emotions impact us how they impact others so that is very important and another thing i think um, for me emotions is something that uh, relates to motivations as well relates to how i pursue my goals i think that also has a very deep connection with emotions and uh, lastly something that that is less often discussed but uh, i would like to mention here uh, being a student of psychology that emotions have a great impact on our physical uh, well being as well and researches have shown that people who suffer chronic stress for a very long period of time they tend to have a greater um, tendency of developing um, conditions like heart disease kidney disease and all of those things so i think it is very important to see uh, what lies beneath the emotions and how can we manage emotions how can we manage our emotions how can we manage the emotions of others to sort of direct life that is uh, in our best benefit i think that's a great answer mariam i'm so pleased to hear the depth of your continued understanding on the topic of emotions i i the last meeting you and i had i i remember discussing our internal reaction to emotions and then the externality of emotions how other people can impact or trigger our internal emotions i also think as you rightly said that emotions are truly motivating factors for people's decision making and if we focus on for the moment if we focus on external emotions for other people's emotions is what i'm trying to get at to clarify the word when other people are in front of us let's say we are in a mediation and there are two clients in front of us or conflict resolution and we have two people or three people and if we understand their let's use the word emotional interest emotional right. background emotional motivating factors then perhaps we can also facilitate the discussion better for a resolution Absolutely. because now we go deeper into who they are any comments on that yeah that that is very rightly said i think uh, the process of mediation is all about knowing what is going on with the other person mm -hmm. uh, because they come with a certain conflict uh, which is which can be very emotional uh, on the face of it but i think deeper down the emotions are basically the motivating factors behind their core interests so i don't think mediation can be complete without reaching to the core interests and i don't think um, emotions can be neglected uh, while reaching the core interests of the parties so it it is both ways i think the stronger you prepare the stronger is your case uh, the better you can handle the conflict resolution process let's let's go there a little bit sometimes what happens is we are trained at least here in the us we are trained and i know pakistan culture and society and legal culture is different than american society culture and legal culture but coming to this question which i think transcends boundaries sometimes we are taught trained and we train others that when you see emotions you acknowledge them you try to empathize but yes. you don't do a emotional bond you don't do someone you don't say to someone i agree with your emotion or so there's a boundary you say i see your emotion but i don't agree with your emotion in a sense Absolutely. you remain in impartiality across the room what is yes. your thinking as you're researching this topic of emotions what have you found out what's the best topics or uh, uh, tips that you have for this uh, this idea yeah i think uh, uh... a mediator is a separate complete human being and the parties that are coming for mediation are also separate complete human beings uh, that can be right wrong you can agree disagree with them but they have their own own emotional state of being and the mediator has his or her own emotional state of being 
so um, as we i'm sorry for quoting examples from psychology again and again but i i'll come to mediation right after this example so in psychotherapy we say that sometimes when the the patient comes to you and he or she is crying uh, and it has triggered something in the psychotherapist the psychotherapist might also start crying so you know this is not right uh, this will not lead anywhere because one person has to keep his or her emotional content to himself or herself and i think only that is the way forward but i think if you are hearing somebody's story in mediation and you are showing no signs of emotional connection i think the parties in that case will not really be able to connect with you they will not be able to trust you um so not going very emotional i think but it is all right if you say that uh, you can imagine how difficult things were for you or it must be very overwhelming for you or i understand that it was a difficult phase of your life i think saying these words or maybe through facial expressions through gestures through the many non verbal behavioral cues we can make them feel heard we can make them make their feelings feel make their feelings feel they we can make them basically feel validated mm -hmm. so to that extent i think connecting emotionally not i think 100% because no matter how much you try to empathize no matter how much you try to sort of put yourself in the other person's shoes there will be a gap uh, you cannot exactly feel what the other person is feeling until and unless you are that person which you are not so uh, sitting at a distance seeing things from an outsider's perspective i think the best that we that we can do is to validate is to understand is to give them a safe space and uh, as far as i have understood there are two things which uh, sort of make people not feel comfortable let's say it like this one is that they think that their information will go elsewhere the idea of confidentiality so i think the moment we uh, ensure them that whatever they are sharing is in safe hands that will basically uh, motivate them to share further information and the second thing is this fear which i think um, consciously unconsciously or maybe subconsciously is there in everybody's head and that is the fear of being judged the fear of judgment and that can be very subtly uh, you know communicated by very subtle cues for example if somebody is telling me a story and i frown or i you know make some face it will communicate that you know i'm being judged or i might have done something wrong or i have done something that does not necessarily align with the mediator's set of beliefs and values so this is where the mediator should you know keep these emotions or these facial expressions to their selves uh, the moment that fear of judgment is removed from a communication i think people are more open people are more uh, willing to share and uh, the more they share i think they make the whole story easy for the mediator what a great answer right i thought you brought up multiple good points and let me just summarize them for our audience for whoever is listening to us and that is first concept i think you like you discussed is the idea of emotional connection and i really like that idea because i think even we can have a distance and i love when you said we cannot 100% understand or empathize with anybody's emotions because it is their emotions uh, there is always will be distance but you did say that we still can do our best to try to have emotional connection and that included validation listening and let me add a couple of thoughts respectful listening uh, bringing your okay. presence to a room so a person feels dignified a person feels that they are being respected for what they are going through because i think what they are doing at that very moment uh, mariam and correct me if i'm wrong is they are being vulnerable to you they are they are opening up a part of their life which is not just um, legally confidential but also uncomfortable it is also private private to private life and Absolutely. and building that connection i believe you you very rightly said we have to we have to respect that they are opening up uh, through through trust building right you mentioned 
confidentiality. I think confidentiality absolutely leads to trust building. So the two barriers you mentioned to emotional right. connection is this idea that this person may not trust me or where will my information go? And I love the idea of the fear of judgment or what will he or she think about if I do share all of that. Is your research or your understanding and your experience telling you that tackling these topics out front, telling someone, look, our communication today is confidential, private between you and me, and I'm not here to judge you. So I want you to be free in your explanation and your sharing of emotions. Do you think saying that outright can be more productive in mediations? I think that uh, it is not important that you say everything out loud. Some, I think most of the conversations and the communications that we do as human beings are nonverbal. We say a lot in nonverbal domains as we as much as we say in verbal domains. I think most of the communication that we do is nonverbal. So I don't think we have to, it's my humble opinion, my understanding that uh, unless and until you are sort of pushed to that point in mediation that you think that the other person is not able to understand, you can verbalize it. You can say that you can trust me, your information is going to be confidential or I am open to whatever uh, beliefs, values you conform with. I'm absolutely all right about it. You can verbalize it. But I think for the mediation process to be to be smooth, it is necessary that you convey these messages through nonverbal communication. So uh, you don't have to say that I don't judge you. You can just be very mindful of your facial expressions, of your eye gestures, of your um, body language. You can be very mindful about and very respectful. Yeah, I think that's the right word. Very respectful towards that. You have to value the other person's values. You have to value the other person's beliefs. So I think all human beings are do possess that amount of emotional intelligence. I can say that they will understand how uh, comfortable they can feel and how not so comfortable that they can feel around a, around a certain mediator. That's terrific. And I think at some point, maybe towards the end, I can share some experience from cross-cultural because this idea yeah. of how we see body language is unique around the world. And exactly. let's say in US, we have low context communication. So sometimes we we do express through more words. We are more explicit. We are more direct. We do like to plant seeds in another's brain. Whereas maybe in our society in Pakistan, India, and the peninsula there, we are more indirect. We are more through body language. It's an exciting conversation we can have in a few minutes. Um, let me let me take you further into this idea of your uh, your expertise and your gaining expertise as a student in psychology and peace and conflict studies. What can we learn to work with emotions better, starting with internally? Tell us about that. Right. So I think uh, both as a psychotherapist. And as a mediator, for both of them, it is very important that they understand their own emotions and sort of develop their emotional intelligence to the point that they, they are aware of exactly what they are feeling. And only then I think they will be able to understand what the other person is going through. So uh, emotions, I think it is something that at a personal level sometimes lack clarity people uh, may not consciously know what exactly they are feeling and how they are expressing it because um, sometimes pain is expressed in the form of anger. Sometimes grief is expressed in the form of anger. So being aware to, being rather self-aware to, uh, to all those things, it is very important. And um, another thing that I think can help, that, that actually helps me as well, is uh, the idea of self-reflection. So we say that uh, as a psychotherapist, when a lot of people you are seeing, you a lot of stories you are hearing all day around, it is an emotionally exhausting job. And I think so is the case with the uh, mediators. 
I think the, the very profession of mediation is um, equally emotionally exhausting. So there must be some time, maybe some part of the day, a few hours of work, some part of the week, or maybe at least a couple of days in a month where you sit down with yourself and do that uh, internal work with emotions. And uh, that can be done through journaling, through writing down how your day has been, how your uh, week has been, um, who got on your nerves, all of that stuff. You can you can maybe just, uh, you know, tear those pages off before going to bed, but at least, you know, let it out. Do that catharsis. That is very important. Another phenomena is that of uh, cognitive restructuring. That, that is very important. Uh, and that is that you have to basically challenge your unhelpful or distorted or unhealthy thinking patterns. And you have to replace them or basically, first of all, you have to identify them that where are things going wrong? Where do I feel internally, emotionally disturbed? What is bothering me? So it is part of the internal work with emotions that you identify what is going wrong, where it is going wrong, for how long has it been going wrong, and then uh, replace those thoughts by positive thoughts, by more constructive thoughts, by more uh, rational thoughts. And because I think there are always two sides to the story. You can always uh, see the glass half full and you can always see the glass half empty. So I think sitting down with yourself and trying to challenge your own thoughts can uh, help you give a different perspective on things. And it is very, very important, I think, to have uh, social support. It is very important to uh, take time off uh, for yourself. Uh, and I think all these things can help. Similarly, for mediators, I think uh, uh, stress management is very important. Anger management is very important. And uh, for doing that, uh, a lot of time is needed. So while making life for other people easy, I think uh, psychologists and mediators should and must, I think, take some time off for, their sem for themselves as well to sort of process their emotions, to channel channelize all that is going on inside in constructive ways rather than destructive ways. And uh, I think uh, one important thing is not to suppress emotions because uh, suppressing emotions means that you are um, sort of bottling up something inside of you which, will, which can erupt anytime. And it will not wait for you to figure it out at that time. It will be very overwhelming. So it is important that as you go along, you keep processing your emotions, you keep understanding yourself, you make sure that uh, nothing is bothering you for a very long time and uh, channelize it through uh, positive ways because suppressed emotions may come out as um, addictions. Suppressed emotions may come out as uh, anger uh, and uh, you know you ending up saying unpleasant things to people at the end of the day who don't deserve to be a target of or a projection of what you have been going through. So we all are human beings. I think we all need that space. And it is very important to have that space to maybe channel it out in uh, going for a walk, maybe talking to somebody, maybe, as I mentioned earlier, journaling, maybe talking to yourself, the, the process of um, cognitive restructuring is all about talking to yourself. So I think this is how um, the internal work with emotions can be done. I, I think I've learned so much in the last couple of minutes from you and that will uh, help my clients. Uh, and I, I hope everybody hearing understands we're not giving any medical advice here. We are having a discussion on conflict resolution on, exactly. on every case is different. So I just want to make sure you you all know that, but we are here discussing understanding emotions. And uh, Mariam, this was uh, this was very helpful. What I what I really liked is your the fact that you took us to this what I would call emotional hijack. 
what is hijacking mm-hmm. us? If if we are emotionally hijacked ourselves, you do, you raised a very good question within your answer. If you are emotionally hijacked with your own emotions, can you actually listen to someone and understand someone else's emotion? Or in other words, we are always going to have a lens. The question is how colored our lens is as we are seeing somebody else or how colored our hearing is as we listen to somebody else. And the more emotionally hijacked we are, the less perhaps understanding, clear understanding we might have of the other. Am I right there? Exactly. Is that Exactly. Absolutely. Absolutely. Excellent. And then I love your idea with positivity, social support, time out, stress management, and the idea of stressed, uh, suppressed emotions. Terrific. I want to use this time to ask you one more question, maybe make it more difficult. How about highly emotional conflicts? Do we do we prepare separately for them? Um, let me throw in the word, in the US at least, we are very, um, we, we love using the word high conflict personalities that some of mm-hmm. us disagree with. There are high conflict personalities. We know there are high conflict situations, but and on all the above, how do we approach them differently, if you may, while preparing? Yeah. So I think we will have to put conflicts in two boxes uh, for this question. And one is the interpersonal conflict or interstate conflict. And the in the other box, we may like to put intrapersonal conflict or intrastate conflict, uh, uh, putting in some uh, terminologies from international relations here. I think both of these conflicts have a different approach. So in case of uh, interpersonal conflicts, I think the approach is always to discuss the issue uh, separately with both the parties or maybe multiple parties and then do all the homework, do all the preparation that is required. And as far as uh, intrapersonal conflict is concerned, which is a conflict that is going on within a person, that is a conflict that I think the person who is going through it is the best um, person to resolve it as well. Because as we mentioned earlier, that you cannot exactly put yourself in somebody else's shoes. So um, inter- intrapersonal conflicts can be something that a person is trying to do, but is unable to do. Something that a person believes strongly, a value that a person strongly upholds but fails to practice it, maybe because of social pressure, maybe because of any other thing. So there is a constant conflict that is going on inside of a person, inside of a person's brain. Mm -hmm. Something that uh, they're interested in, something that they are unable to achieve. So that that is a very different thing. And I think both of these conflicts can be high intensity conflicts, or as you said, high intensity, uh, uh, high conflict personalities. So uh, that needs a different approach, I think. And uh, But I think listening is one thing that can process a lot of things. If you just um, sit down with a person, no matter how complicated, how conflicted the background is, I think a lot is processed. And uh, it basically opens a lot of space and opens a lot of room for uh, you as a mediator to reach to the core issues and uh, the core interests. And the moment you are there, I think half of your case is resolved. You can comment it, comment it uh, on it in a better way, I think, since you are a pretty, pretty practitioner and a very experienced one as well. Thank you. I, I do actually like to speak on listening. <laughs> Today is not my interview. So I will say, I'll say just a couple of short words, but... Um... I think as human beings, we all have a need to be heard. Mm. The question is how well we are heard, who is listening Mm. to us, and when in the first category, well we are heard, are they listening with respect, time, presence, and with emotional connection as we have been discussing today. And I think it Mm. does lead us to a better 
a better conversation, a more open and honest conversation. Like I feel like this this one is happening in this conversation. So appreciate all your sharing with us, Mariam. And I like the categories you put us into intrapersonal and intrastate versus interpersonal intrastate. I also want to um, thank a woman who helped connect us, who brought yeah. this connection together. And that is Miss Nudrat Racha, who's um, a senior fellow with the Weinstein International Foundation and was a Jams Weinstein fellow uh, who came to US and a terrific lawyer and mediator from Pakistan as well. Just a shout out to Nudrat. Thank Thanks. you um, <laughs> for this connection. I uh, that That's mostly my questions. Uh, do you have any questions for me, Mariam, before I... Yes, of end? course. Uh, as we were mentioning earlier, I would like to take this conversation back to that point of the cultural differences that come uh, while people experience emotions and the cultural differences that come uh, the way a certain culture deals with those emotions. So you might like to comment on that. Very briefly, I think that's an excellent question. I think also understudied because I do know in some cultures, emotions are, as the word you bought to borrow from you, bottled up because partly you are taught to bottle up emotions. In fact, you're not, you're not taught to deal with emotions, right? Mm -hmm. And I will even, in addition to national culture, let's say the difference between India and US or Pakistan and US, I'll also include gender as a culture. Uh, my, and please forgive me all of you who are listening if I'm not right here, but I believe men are not taught to deal with emotions even um, at, at, the, at, the, at the larger stage. We are, uh, we are supposed to act in a certain way in society. We are supposed to act in a certain way when we become emotional, when we see emotions in our media, our movies, our depictions of art in society puts so much pressure starting with young men and then of course as we grow i'm not saying i'm excluding women all the just wanted to comment on that because as a man i can only relate to how i grew up so this idea of not just cross cultural dealing with emotion but cross culturally dealing with emotions within your culture within your region within your gender is is fascinating so one example i'll give quickly as i said earlier was uh, high context and low context. So in the U.S., we will, if we call it low context society, uh, borrowing terms from Hofstede, and that would be we are more expressive, we use more words, we are more direct, and we are more explicit. And I think those terms not necessarily, Mariam, I don't think they necessarily, we deal with emotions better here because we do have a high stress society. We do have a high you know, less a divorce rate because of miscommunication or no no communication. So there are all these issues this society is facing too. So it's not like because we are low context, everything is perfect. But what I've realized living here for close to two decades in the US is sometimes we have this way of expression that can be helpful to clients. Saying something, I notice that you are angry when you speak about this, can open a pathway for that person to go on. Yes, I'm angry, and here is the reason why. So mm -hmm. I've learned from those techniques because you are outwardly opening up. Cross-culturally, my issue with that question is not that's a wrong question. It's a perfectly great statement and stats slash question. Cross-culturally, what happens is some people are not trained or taught or programmed because of the culture they grew up in to discuss a, that they are angry, B, that that they don't even have the awareness that they're angry, and C, yeah. even if even if they're aware and they are going to discuss they're angry, they don't know how to do it because they haven't exactly. been asked that question before. Mm -hmm. Do you do you do well, you the society and the culture somehow uh, I don't know about US, but in South Asia, uh, you are a good girl or a good boy if you keep your emotions to yourself. <laughs> and mm. I think for a longer See, just, run, just that, that term, creates just, a lot of problem. Just, exactly, just that term, right? In the US, we're very particular. Above 18, you become a man and a woman, right? So yeah, so we say you're a good good man and a good woman. Good but man that's, and a good woman. Right. So that's, that's, that's that terminology. See how it shifts across mm -hmm. cultures. Um, but excellent point. You are a better person. Let's use that term. 
um, if you are don't express emotions, don't show emotions. Now, Mariam, I've been teaching for 20 years here in the U.S., close to, sorry, forgive me, close to 20 years in the U.S. I, I have seen students from all over the world, right? Close to 30, 40 countries. I've been to 70 countries. And I can tell you one thing. It's absolutely right that people are taught to deal with emotions differently in different cultures. Hmm. Sometimes it takes me a year, one year plus time to let's say connect with a student from India and to actually hear what they're going through. And mm -hmm. it fascinates me that why didn't you tell me the year before? Because they, they never did it. They never expressed what yeah. they are going through in life or, or they were exploring that communication within themselves and they're learning from the West. Oh, people are talking about it. People are talking about real things and it's okay to come out and say it. What yeah. I'm, what's, what is good with me, what's wrong with me? So good question, long answer, but thank you for asking. Yeah, and another question I'd like to ask, um, what do you think are the reasons that uh, uh, conflicts or specifically difficult conflicts have so many emotions in them? Why Why do you think all of these emotions come in, in conflicts that are difficult yeah. or high intensity? I, great point. I think... I think we've been just touching on that. And I think it's, it's the, the background is, is the unpreparedness of human mind, body, mm -hmm. and soul. Unpreparedness from a young age to deal with difficulty. We've been told to fight or mm -hmm. flight, right? Yeah. We, we've been not told to sit, listen to yourself, mm -hmm. as you said, and listen to the other and manage. So... Yeah. For example, here in the U.S., I'm helping one organization at least a little bit, uh, con Kids Without Conflict, which is trying to teach younger kids now how to manage conflict, which I'm very proud to see that initiative under a Southern California Mediation Association earlier. And mm -hmm. we need to do more of that. We need to teach children how to manage conflict because when they grow up, when they become adults, mm -hmm. they will have, I think, more awareness, more understanding on how to how to just unpack, how to yeah. unpack the role that conflict plays on them. So so that's my quick answer. If we do not know how to manage it, what happens then is we have unmet expectations within ourselves. We're not aware of that. That's unconscious level, yes. subconscious level. Mm -hmm. Because of that unmet expectations, we are triggered. We are not personally, internally blissful or happy or even content. Mm -hmm. And if you're not blissful, happy or content, what happens is we react. So then somebody mm -hmm. says something to us because of unmet expectations and our unhappiness. Now we are reacting. And what's the best way to react? I'm going to get mad at you. I'm going to be angry at you. Now, when mm -hmm. I'm angry at you, I'm actually saying, please listen to me. I'm actually exactly. saying, I'm actually saying I'm unheard. Um, mm -hmm. You did not listen. So, but how am I saying that to you? You are wrong. You are bad. You are this. So yes. what happened there is the translation of, please listen to me, or, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, I've done this much for you. I really like you, but you're not giving time back to me in a relationship conflict, for example. It converts into this statement of anger and, mm -hmm. and, and vengeance and blame. And in fact, mm -hmm. we have to understand blame. It becomes a blame. You did this to me. That's where I'm mad right now. Yes. Yes. Now, deep down, if you hear people like Thich Nhat Hanh from uh, Vietnamese monk who we lost last year, mm -hmm. uh, we understand that in long time, we realize the beauty uh, of actually learning how to switch that one statement from you are the reason we did this. You, I'm going to be mad at you. To switching to saying, you know, at this very moment, I'm very vulnerable and I'm not feeling good. And I have these emotional reactions that I myself don't understand how to react. And I don't want to be disrespectful to you because I'm really like you, really want to respect you. So at this very moment, would you mind if I take a break? Would you mind if I just pause and think and understand what I'm going through? If we just taught that break, that pause, that as you use the word self-reflection, which you are mm -hmm. absolutely right, comes through journaling and thinking. 
And I think as a society, we could, we could be much better off. Exactly. That is so right. And as you mentioned about this organization, I think the work with emotions and specifically the work, the internal work with emotions, it must start from a very early age. From a very early age, I must say. And um, talking about how emotions are so relevant in terms of conflicts, I would like to add my very humble opinion here. Please. That emotions are sometimes uh, triggered when some need is being challenged or when some need is being threatened. Now it can be the, uh, as uh, Meslor discuss, uh, discuss, discussed his hierarchy of needs, that there are many needs. So let's pick one. Let's pick the need of identity. Uh, if that need of identity is either not being met or is being challenged or let's say is being uh, threatened by somebody, that will uh, basically make a lot of emotions come into play. So for example, if there is a uh, conflict of custody of children and uh, the parents are both trying to get it here is where the identity of a mother is being threatened the identity of being a father is being threatened or somebody is saying you're not a good father you're not a good mother so a lot of emotions come in there secondly if we are talking about conflicts that are related to let's say ethnicity ethnic identity religion religious identity if somebody feels that those needs and i think it every or any conflict, there is some need that is being um, either challenged or threatened or somebody is, you know, trying to hijack from that need from the other person. I think those uh, identity issues and the need to belongingness, the need where you conform with a certain belief, a certain group, whenever those needs come in and there is a problem revolving around that identity crisis, I think that is where... Uh, high intensity emotions coming so yeah I, conflicts I, difficult conflicts have difficult emotions i absolutely agree with that i want to just add to that that is so understanding have been being in the field of cross cultural thinking and uh, communication one thing i'll add is that people we 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 are not even aware of our needs to begin with right i mean those are five needs as we you mentioned uh, popularly mm -hmm. published but i will go deeper from cultural lens so when mm -hmm. we use the word identity we don't even know what our identity is because we have multiple identities and they switch over time. So which identity? And then being aware, having a reflection that perhaps when I'm at work, my work identity kicks in and perhaps in my work identity, my reputation and the need to prove that I am competent kicks in. And maybe there, 20 years ago, there was an incident that taught me to act like this. So thinking that is and our home, we have a family identity or an identity of being a husband or father or a wife or a mother or a daughter. These, that's an interesting conversation to have, right? To unpack just that one word identity and which identity is playing a role at the moment of having an emotional reaction. And that awareness is powerful because it not just lets you control and be aware, but it gives you power to manage yourself, which can be yeah. very fruitful. I think I think this was a good discussion for today. Maybe we should do yes. a part two, Mariam, because it mm -hmm. uh, looks like we are just starting a discussion on going into deeper topics like identity and culture and emotions. And perhaps we can pick on that, especially understanding mm -hmm. from you growing up and living in Islamabad, Pakistan, I grew up in Punjab, India, but now live in the U.S. And there are many of our fellow citizens, both in Pakistan, India, and the U.S., who may be interested to learn more about how they grew up, where they grew up, and how did emotions play a role in their understanding of self, understanding of conflicts around them, and then, of course, in conflict resolution. Yes, I think it was an amazing uh, session with you. I've been really looking forward to it, and uh, I'm really honored and I would like to specially thank you for trusting me with this opportunity and reference to our last conversation, sort of bursting my bubble of self-doubt. <laughs> so I, I'm very grateful for that. Absolutely. I'm, no. that. I'm, I'm, Ms. Shahid, I'm very proud of you. You're doing wonderful work. Mm -hmm. I really want you to continue to go up this leadership ladder. 
uh, not just in terms of titles, but in terms of take changing the world, we need more peacemakers from different backgrounds, from different diverse backgrounds, and we need more women peacemakers, leaders. So thank you for all you're doing. Thank you for spending you the time. Much. And spe especially thank, thank you, you for much. picking up this difficult topic of understanding emotions. Okay? Thank you. So I thank, thank you one more time before I close out. My pleasure, sir. My pleasure.